Um, well, welcome. You guys are the ones who uh, were the frozen chosen. Here we are, because it is super cold this morning. So congratulations on all of us making it here. I hope you guys are doing okay in these frigid temperatures today. But it's good to come together because it's warm in this building, and we're going to praise the Lord regardless of how cold or how hot it is outside. So just a couple of announcements for you all. Um, the Bible study on Tuesday mornings, we have resumed. So we are meeting at 10.30 a.m., and we're studying the book of James. So if you're interested in joining that, just come on down, or you can connect with me, and I will get you some more information on that. We also today do have prayer after service, so if you would like to have some individual prayer by one of our prayer team members, just head on into the parlor and you can have um, your brothers and sisters pray for you this morning. And here's a very important announcement of a big change, an exciting change. Starting February 13th, which, yep, remember the day before Valentine's Day, but starting February 13th, this service time is going to change from 10 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. I was almost going to say p.m. there. But 10 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. starting on um, February 13th. And I want to just encourage you to please open your emails, read the newsletters, read the emails that we send out, because there's going to be a lot of exciting news coming out over the next month, and we just want to make sure that everybody knows what's going on. So open those emails. Now, this is an exciting announcement that I have, because, um, you know, just thinking about the goodness of the Lord this morning and the goodness of having a faithful, dedicated servant here for 20 years. Today is Lori's, like, 20th year anniversary serving FPC. So can we just give a round of applause? Now, Lori said to me this morning, Liz, there's no surprises with the prelude, and I'm standing there thinking, but I have one for you. So congratulations, and thank you, Lori. All right, Sib asked me, what's the thought of the week? So here's the thought of the week. I was thinking this morning, I was listening to the hymn, God, You Are So Good, on the way into church today. And I was just filled and overcome with the goodness of the Lord, and I was thinking about my life, and I was thinking about your lives. And it made me think of how many times did I miss the mark? Or how many times did I choose to do things my way or not God's way? And how I veered off the path just going the way I thought I should go. And then it reminded me of Jesus talking about leaving the 99 for the one. And how he goes to such depths and lengths for us because he will never, ever, ever let us go. No matter how we miss it, no matter how our past veer, but the Lord is faithful and he will come. He will go wherever we need to go, or wherever he, we need him to go. So today as we enter into our worship, let's come before him with really grateful hearts. Let's take some time during this service just to thank him and praise him for his goodness and his faithfulness to us. So with that in mind, let's enter in together as into our call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord. We will call on God's name and make known his wonderful works. Seek the Lord continually. We will watch and listen for signs of God's grace. Together, let us worship God. Let us rejoice in God's presence and praise his holy name. Amen. If you are able to stand, please stand for our first hymn.
seated. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God Please join me in saying the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. Eternal God, you made us in your image with minds to know you, hearts to love you, and wills to serve you. Our knowledge is imperfect, our love inconsistent, and our obedience complete. We fail to grow into your likeness, and failing to go where you lead us, we easily wander astray. Forgive us, free us from our sin, and lead us by your spirit to return to your paths. We ask in the gracious name of Jesus Christ. Let us now take a moment to silently confess our sin. Being united to Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, we receive God's mercy, are pardoned of our sins, and are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Because of this, may the peace of the Lord and his forgiveness be always with us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able, please rise for the glory of Patri. Please be seated. We would like to take <clears throat> this opportunity to welcome the children to Sunday school. Children through the fifth grade can be led upstairs by their parents or be dismissed with one of our Sunday school teachers. If you are a visitor, your children are more than welcome to attend.
Good morning. As many of you have know, know and have heard about, one of the 2022 initiatives of our church is to offer a contemporary worship service. And we've talked about hosting that contemporary worship service at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings. And of course, everyone's invited. And today we're proud and, and happy to announce that we believe and know that God has sent someone to lead us in our contemporary music of that service. And, and we're calling that service Common Ground. And this man, his name is Rick Lewis. And what has struck me about Rick is that Rick loves the Lord. Rick has devoted his life to serving the Lord and just as we feel that God has called Rick to lead us in this contemporary common ground worship service, God has placed it on Rick's heart to lead common ground in 2022. And so today with much joy, I introduce to you Rick Lewis. Good morning. As pastor said, my name is Rick Lewis and uh, I am a worship pastor. Um, I, I am a professional musician, and I, I have been for the entire, my entire adult life. Um, I love God. I love music. I love people in the church. I love people outside the church, uh, partic particularly those who uh, are in the artisan community. Um, music is a common ground in my life that has enabled me to reach people in the church uh, to bring um, people in the church into a, a worship experience with God. Music is a common ground in my life that has enabled me to enter into relationship and pastorship with uh, people all around the world who didn't know God. Uh, this common ground service that uh, Pastor Greg has envisioned uh, is a, a beautiful opportunity uh, for me really to partner with you with First Presbyterian Church in creating a common ground space, mm. um, a space of contemporary worship music for the members of First Presbyterian, a space for a safe spiritual experience for people in this community uh, to experience God's love and really maybe for the first time or in a different way. Uh, to experience the love of, of Jesus Christ. Common ground is, I love the term common ground. I don't know if you came up with that or, or whatever, but it's, it, you know, it's, I think it's a divine name, really, because uh, before God we all stand um, equal and on common ground. And so I hope that you will join me and Pastor Greg in our session in making this common ground experience a reality. Uh, the harvest is ripe, but the workers are few, uh, so we need you. Uh, whatever gifts, uh, unique giftings you have, maybe you're not sure what those are, but we can work that out together and figure that out. What I'm specifically looking for is to build a worship team, whatever it may be, of people that um, are led by the Holy Spirit, that um, prefer one another, um, that uh, we can get together and meet and have our own worship times together in a small group kind of environment, maybe perhaps around some breaking bread or pizza together and uh, uh, praying and just having our own worship time um, so we can bring that uh, to common ground as a team. Common Ground and the worship team experience is inclusive of our youth. It's really important to me. I, I'm a strong believer in that uh, training people up in the way to go in worship and in um, uh, teamwork is Jesus' style of, of, of evangelism. Uh, so that's really important, and I, I want your kids involved. So we need to f find out who they are. Um, I am honored and humbled to be a part of this. I'm excited to see what the Lord is going to continue to do. He's already doing. Um, so again, I, I want to invite you to help in any way that you can. 
Uh, we all have a role to play. Um, whether it's in common ground or whether it's in this beautiful traditional service that you have here, uh, together between the traditional and the contemporary, we can create a common ground platform to reach this community. Amen. I believe that. Amen. Amen. We thank God for blessing us with Rick and, and for what God is going to, as Rick said, continue to do through our traditional service and how God is going to reach people through our contemporary service. This morning we are starting a new sermon series on the book of Jonah. If you were raised in church, if you attended any sort of vacation Bible school or Sunday school programming, you probably know Jonah as Jonah and the, the whale. And so we think of Jonah as a children's story, story for kids. But this sermon series is entitled Jonah for adults because we're going to learn that Jonah is for kids, teenagers, and adults. So this morning we are going to tackle chapter one of Jonah and over the next four weeks we will go through all four chapters. So Jonah chapter one verses one through 17. This is a lot of scripture to be reading in, in one sitting out loud. So I may stop a few times to uh, fill you in on, on what's happening. So here's how the book of Jonah begins. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But... Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. That's something, when you, when you get in your car and you go home today, you just try to say Tarshish three times fast. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. So here's a runaway believer, a runaway prophet. How's the Lord respond? We're going to see in verse 4. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. Who sent the storm? Was it the devil? We're not blaming the devil, right? It was the Lord who sent the storm. Verse 5. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below the deck where he had laid down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. This is like rolling dice to find out who's responsible for this calamity. This was something that was common in the ancient world. And God's working through this, right, this fallen method, because they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I am, oh, sorry, he didn't say that. He said, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. True or false, Jonah's running away from the Lord. But he says, I worship the Lord. His own estimation of himself, his own spiritual practices may not be accurate. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? 
They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already, already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault and that this great storm has come upon you. So he says, kill me. That's what he's saying, kill me. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, who's praying? The pagan sailors are praying. Who's not praying? The Hebrew worshiper of the living God. So they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord. So these men are being converted. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Here's the first conversion story in Jonah. Now, the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And you're welcome because I just caught you up on your Bible reading. Last week I had a great conversation with my mentor. And, and we had wrapped up our Zoom conversation and we had prayed. It was, it was time to hang up the, 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 the call. And he stopped before, I could, before we could depart. And, and he said, you know, before you go, there's a few things that I need to share with you. And he went on to share a few encouraging words about the direction that God is moving our church in. And, the, and that part of, 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 the, of the day was not surprising. But here was the surprising part. After that call, I left my study and walked out into the church office. And in the church office, our clerk of session was sitting. And she shared a few things. And then unsolicited by me, she said something that was eerily similar, almost exactly the same as what my mentor had just finished telling me. And so I went back into my study and I wondered, is this the Lord trying to get through to me? Is this God speaking to me through someone else? Is this the word of the Lord? A few years ago, I hosted a, a young adult Bible study. And there was a, a new person who came to this Bible study, and I knew nothing about her spiritual journey. So I asked her, do you believe in God? And she, she said, yes, I do believe in God. And then she told me that she came to faith in college. And here's how she came to faith in college. One night, she went out with a big group of friends. They drove out to a party. When the party was over, it was late at night. They all loaded back into the car, into their vehicle to go home. And by her own admission, she said, I was the type of person who never wore my seatbelt. But I heard a voice that told me, put on your seatbelt. And not only did I put on my seatbelt for the first time in a very long time, before we left, I insisted that all my friends put on their seatbelts as well. A few minutes later, that car she was in was hit head on by a drunk driver. The police officer who came to the scene said, your seatbelts saved your lives. She said, that was God. 
God spoke to me. It was the word of the Lord to her. Is there a time in your life when not, you can look, look back, right? You, you're, you imagine yourself driving along and you look in the rear view mirror of the car and you look back on your life and, and you can say that there was a time that God spoke to you. That there was a time that you heard the word of the Lord. See, the first time we're introduced to Jonah, the famous Jonah and the whale, is not in the book of Jonah. We first find Jonah in 2 Kings chapter 14. And in 2 Kings 14 verse 25, we learn that Jonah was a servant of the Lord. He had devoted his life to the Lord. Jonah served as one of the Lord's prophets. Jonah the prophet stood in the presence of the Lord. Jonah the prophet knew the voice of the Lord. Jonah had seen into the purposes and plans of of the Lord. History had unfolded just as the Lord and Jonah said it would. When God spoke, Jonah spoke. And Jonah was not just any prophet, he was King Jeroboam II's prophet. When the king of Israel obeyed the word of the Lord through the prophet Jonah, Israel was blessed with a period of prosperity and security. Jonah had heard the word of the Lord and he knew that he had this gifting and this privilege to hear the word of the Lord from the Lord God Almighty himself. And I'll say it again, when God spoke to Jonah, Jonah spoke to the people. And at the start of the book of Jonah, once again, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the prophet. Go to Nineveh the great city and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. And we might expect that Jonah would do what Jonah has always done. Jonah would relay the word of the Lord to the people of Nineveh. Verse 3, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port and after paying the fare he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Can I share with you what this made me think of? You have no choice, right? So when, when I read this passage this week and I thought about Jonah doing the exact opposite of what the Lord asked him to do, I thought about my son, Ben, who's one years old. You know, we attempt to, to serve Ben dinner. And when we, when we give Ben dinner, we place a plate of food on his tray. Give him a plate and, and we tell Ben, now the food goes into your mouth. We make it abundantly clear. We even show Ben how the food goes into his mouth. So here's Ben's response to the word of his father. He takes the food off his tray. He brings it up to his mouth, almost making you believe that this time he is going to put the food in his mouth. And then he does one of these while he's looking you square in the eye. drops it on the floor and smiles. Then Ben goes for his plate. He picks up his plate with both hands and once again, he removes the plate from the area where the tray perhaps could support it. He drops it on the floor and once again gives his father a big smile. Ben is doing the exact opposite of what his parents have asked of him. Someone who has older kids can say out loud, get used to it. So the Lord commands Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach. 
in Nineveh was 500 miles to the northeast of Israel. Nineveh is in modern day Iraq. The Bible tells us that he set sail for Tarshish. Tarshish is 2,500 miles to the west, found today in modern day Spain. Jonah does the exact opposite of what the word of the Lord told and commanded of him. Now, it's easy for me to judge the runaway prophet. It's easy for us to snicker at his folly. How could he be so silly to believe that he could run away from the Lord? But what if Jonah was doing what we do in our everyday lives? I'm not saying that we are so obviously rebellious or go to the same lengths to disobey the word of the Lord, but what if in some modern way God says to us every day, go to Nineveh and we set sail for Tarshish? We know the word of the Lord. Even, even if you've been in church for a little while, even if you find yourself not listening during the sermons or zoning out while the scriptures are read, you know the word of the Lord. You've known the word of the Lord since you were a child. You understand the word of the Lord. You know what the Lord Jesus commands of us. And we run away from the Lord without ever running away from the Lord. It doesn't take you moving to a different geographical location to run away from the Lord. We run away from the Lord in more subtle ways, perhaps, than Jonah. I think we run away from the Lord when we put the word of the Lord on the back burner in our lives. Out of sight, out of mind. We run away emotionally. We set our affections on everything and everyone but the word of the Lord. We run away mentally. We just don't think about the Lord or incorporate the word of the Lord into our thought life on a daily basis. We run away ambitiously. We prioritize and strive for everything but fulfilling the word of the Lord. Or we just say that we'll fulfill the word of the Lord someday, but not today. What God is asking of us is not always easy. His commands are hard. Following Christ is simple, but it's not easy. It will cost you. For some, it'll cost us more than others. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Give generously. Be holy as I am holy. Forgive always. Turn the other cheek. Love your wife as your own body. Don't slander the politicians. Pray for the emperor. Do not exasperate your children. Slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to become angry. So when I think of Jonah, when we think of Jonah, the first thing I have to do is come to grips with the fact in many ways I am Jonah. There are periods in our lives when we can say we are devoted to the Lord. We can look back as Jonah looked back and say that we are with the Lord, God's servants, God's guys, God's girls, that, that we were faithful in this area. But we also have to acknowledge that there are areas in our lives in which we are running away from the Lord, mentally, emotionally, that, that we can become hearers of the word, but not doers of the word. We know what God says, but doing it is hard. It's uncomfortable. It's inconvenient. It requires us to change. Greg ran away. Rick ran away. Melissa ran away. Liz ran away. I don't know about you, I don't want to be a runaway. 
as I studied the history behind this passage, Jonah's reasons for running away from the Lord are, are better than my reasons, probably better than your reasons. He's being sent by God to Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And if you know anything about the history of Israel, the Assyrians tried to wipe the Israelites off the map three times. We're talking about war. We're talking about invasion, torture, occupation, rape, murder. Pastor Tim Keller said, when, when you think of Syria, you should think of ISIS with the military capacity of the United States. How do you think it would work out for an American preacher to go to ISIS-controlled territories and call them to repentance in the name of Jesus? How do you think it would work out for a Jewish rabbi to go to a neo-Nazi rally and preach against their wickedness in the name of God Almighty? Jonah was being sent to a more powerful, ruthless enemy and told by God to preach against it. It's scary and uncomfortable. And as we see later in the book, Jonah's greatest fear was that Assyria would repent and be forgiven by God. And as Jonah saw it, as long as Syria existed, Israel's existence was in peril. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, and he didn't see how obeying God could possibly work out for him or for his people, Israel. God commanded it. I don't understand it. I don't agree with it. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel good. I don't see any benefit for me. I see no positive outcome for us. I'm running away from the word of the Lord. And what's at the heart of the runaway? And this is for Jonah and this is for me. We don't trust God. We don't trust that the word of the Lord is, is ultimately for our good. At the end of the day, we say, I know better than God, and that's pride. This will, this will not make me happy obeying the word of the Lord, and that's selfishness. I'm going to Tarshish. And so now here's the big question. How does God respond to runaways? What does God do with Jonah? Verse 4, the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. That was the work of the Lord. He sent a storm. And I want to warn you, one mistaken way to understand this story is every storm in life is from God. It's not true. We don't understand every difficulty and trial and tribulation as a result of you sinned, now God has sent a storm. We don't believe that God is up in heaven planning out all these little storms to send upon his people. I would never tell you that every difficulty and storm in life is from God because you are running away. It's not true. We live in a fallen world. We live in a, a, an evil world. There are storms that are not God's storms. There are storms that I would go as far to say are Satan's storms. So we're not saying that the storm is a result, every storm is a result of sin. But what we are saying is this, every difficulty is attached to your sin. When you sin, it comes with a storm. And perhaps you've convinced yourself like Jonah, you thought, I got away with it, I'm asleep on the boat, I've gotten away. But every sin comes with a storm. Sin will find you out, sin will hurt you, and sin will hurt those closest to you. And here's the, the interesting part about the story. And I want you to understand this. God is not sending the storm to hurt Jonah. I don't believe that the storm was sent by God so that the Lord would inflict some sort of pain on Jonah. The, the, the Lord is trying to exact vengeance upon the runaway believer. The storm is sent to stop Jonah from running away. 
And so we can look at the storm, the storms of life, the storms that come with our sin as a bad thing, as the wrath of God. But if the storm is designed to stop us and get us back on track, the storms that God send are not meant to destroy us. In fact, they are an expression of God's love. Because God is not satisfied with leaving us in a place of disobedience and sin. That the Lord sends a storm because the Lord is concerned that Jonah will not fulfill his destiny, his purpose in life. I would invite you this morning to see the storm as an expression of God's love, that God is pursuing the runaway with his love. And it's, it's rocky. It's rocky. And the storm grows worse and worse, and the ship threatens to break up, that God will go to, to extreme lengths to, to win us back. To get, us our, to get our attention, to turn us back around, to, to win us back and, and to invite us back into his love. That's absolutely true. The storm is an expression of God's love. And it's scary. It's scary for all those in the boat. And the sailors are convinced that they're going to die. And if, if you're on a ship and the sailors are scared, you're in trouble. And here's kind of the big thing that happens in chapter 1. Nothing changes. The storm does, continues to rage until Jonah stops running. That the storm rages until Jonah stops running. And Jonah tells the sailors, the only way to stop this storm is for me to surrender. The only way for me to stop this storm is, is for me to stop the, stop the running. And he convinces them to throw him overboard. And he's thrown into the stormy seas. And in the midst of the storm that is created by Jonah running away from the Lord, we see God's love and God's provision. And God's love and God's provision comes in an unexpected way. And you know the way that it comes because this is the famous part of the story of Jonah. It's Jonah and the great big fish. God provides refuge in the belly of this great fish. And Jonah's life is saved and spared. And God is going to move him back on track. It's a story about God pursuing sinners and runaways with his love and i want to close with with this thought for you the sailors are convinced after jonah is thrown overboard and the sea is calm that they have to make a sacrifice and a vow to god that they have to thank god and 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 make vows to serve him this story of Jonah points to someone who is greater than Jonah. And Jesus says that this story about Jonah is really about him. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is speaking with the religious leaders, and he's in, in verses 38 through 41, he's speaking to the religious leaders, and, and they're asking him for a sign that they may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the one he says that he is. And Jesus says to them, only a wicked and rebellious generation asks for a sign. The only sign that you'll receive is the sign of Jonah, who was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. So it will be with the Son of Man, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so this story about a Hebrew sinner points us to a story about a Hebrew Savior. This story about one who runs away, who, who runs away from God, tells us about one who came as the presence of God to pursue those who are running away from God. And just as Jonah was thrown into a storm and was powerless to calm the storm, we have a story about Jesus Christ 
who's he and his disciples found themselves in a storm and what Jonah was powerless to do and calm the storm Jesus stood up with all the power of God and calmed the waves and the winds that storm was not the storm that Christ chose instead Christ chose a different storm the storm that he chose was the storm of our sin. The storm that he experienced when he went to the cross to pay the price for our sins and to take on God's wrath, to pay. It was a sacrifice of his life. And just as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, Jesus spent three days in the heart of the earth, in the grave. And just as Jonah was given new life, miraculously spit out by the fish after three days, Jesus Christ rose from the grave. And he rose from the grave. And that is the reason today that Christ himself continues to pursue all the Jonas, all us runaways, that he offers forgiveness and a new life, a new path through faith and obedience to Jesus Christ and that is the invitation today what is the word of the Lord to you today what is Christ speaking to you and to us the question is not what is the word of the Lord or does the Lord still speak the question is how will you respond to the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ? The one who is far greater than Jonah. Let us pray together. Lord, you are the, the word, you are the life, you are the truth, you are the way. We worship you on this day. We thank you that for the storms that you have sent to stop us from sinning, to get our attention, to turn us around. We thank you that you are the God who took on sin and death on our behalf. So Lord, today I pray and I ask that those areas in our lives where we've run away, that we hear the word of the Lord, and that we would turn back in praise and worship. That we would serve you. That we would honor you with our lives, with our actions, with our words. We've been like Jonah, but God, we don't have to continue to be like Jonah. We can be like Jesus. So fill us with your Holy Spirit. Change our hearts and our minds. Change our lives for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Please stand, if able, as we say the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray.
Lord, on this day, we, we thank you that you pursue us, that you are the God who does not give up, but the God who offers a new beginning, a new life, a new heart, a new way with Christ as our Lord. So we praise you for that, and we thank you. And even when we don't understand, Lord, we will serve you and obey you. And Lord, on this morning, we lift up those in our congregation, our families, our friends, and our community who are experiencing storms that were not sent by you, but a result of our fallen nature, our frailty, our human weakness. We especially lift up to you and ask that you would have mercy upon D. Coover, who has pneumonia and COVID. We lift up the family of Michael Richards as they grieve his passing. We lift up Robin Blows and we pray that you would continue to bring healing to her in Jesus' name. We lift up the family of Pam Huth on the one year anniversary of Bill's passing. Lord, we thank you for the answer to prayer for those being held hostage in the synagogue in, in Texas. We thank you, Lord, that they have been set free. We lift up our health care workers and those in our congregation fighting and recovering from, from COVID-19 and, and other ailments. Lord, we pray that you would offer them your comfort, your healing, and your peace in Jesus' mighty name. And Lord, we pray now the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now enter into a time of offering. Would you pray with me? Lord, may we never forget the good things that you do for us. Thank you for forgiving our sins. Thank you for healing diseases. Thank you for your love and tender mercies. Thank you for redeeming us from death. We offer our gifts in grateful response. Please remember there are offering plates in the rear of the sanctuary. And if you are home, you are welcome to make your gift online or write a check and put it in the mail. Please stand if you are able for the doxology. <laughs>
as Christ pursues us with his love and as he speaks to us with his word. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all on this day and forevermore. And all God's people say together, Amen.